This is MJ. I'm an author, I'm an artist, I'm an analyzer. Find all my work at mjmunoz.com. Visit the podcast page for show notes and links. Remember to like, share, and comment to help me grow. This is Swinging Through Comics, episode 73, Scared of Ultraman. This time I'm analyzing the Trials of Ultraman issue 5, which is the uh, fifth and final issue of the Trials of Ultraman, and there's a little teaser in the end for what's next in 2022. So, The Trials of Ultraman number 5 originally was released in comic shops August 4, 2021. The writers are Matthew Groom and Kyle Higgins. The penciler is Francesco Mana. The color artist is Espen Grindetron. And the cover artist uh, for the main cover is uh, Arthur Adams with help from Rochelle Rosenberg. So, here we go. Starting off with the negatives. E-Day's dialogue. I only have the one negative because this was a pretty good comic overall. I didn't like E.D.'s dialogue. I It felt like people uh, like mockingly dismiss or are derisive of uh, dialogue that they claim to be like Joss Whedon quippy dialogue. Uh, I gotta tell you, I watched every single episode of Buffy and Angel and I never had a problem with anybody's dialogue. Uh, it didn't bother me in Avengers. I don't know what else he worked on besides Toy Story 2 or whatever with like, you know, 20 other people. Uh, so I don't really know what they're talking about as far as those, uh, that film and television stuff is concerned. But uh, I thought the phrase... Joss Whedon dialogue when uh, I was listening to Ida here. Um, I talked about the dialogue last time, or like the humor or whatever. I don't think it was a joke. I think it's character of Ida, but I think it is supposed to be funny. I did not find it funny, entertaining at all. Uh, not not good. So I don't. I do not like it. Uh, so that's my big negative for the issue. I got a couple positives. Uh, Kaiju logic, splashy spread, schwatch, colors, and tees. So, uh, the kaiju logic uh, is interesting because they explain that Dolboza, or whatever the guy is called, the walking fire mountain, or whatever, the volcano, who's not a volcano, he's a kaiju, um, it's a little weird that they have a data file on him, but I'm bugged in all Ultraman stuff that they have all this information on kaiju. Like, how could you possibly know that? Who possibly kept those records? Like, supposedly, this Dolboza guy was around for like a thousand years. Who, who was measuring that? That's what I want to know. Anyway. Um... Because it just doesn't make sense to me. But whatever. Uh, it's interesting, though, that, you know, his the reason he was attacking Neo and Crazy was because the synthetic kaiju made of technology. The reason he had first manifested there in Iceland or Greenland or whatever the heck, wherever they were, um, was because the deforestation had happened because people uh, ruined the ecology by taking out all the trees in order to grow crops to feed people. So... Uh, which that's an interesting concept that I'll get to in a minute um, or a few minutes. But, you know, so that application of human technology to subjugate nature to human will uh, was what sparked the kaiju's manifestation there. So then this false kaiju, this mecha kaiju being created or, or you know, utilized, launched, whatever, brings the attention of the kaiju again. And that's why the way to beat him is to destroy the mecha kaiju first, and then it neutralizes uh, the kaiju, and he just goes away peacefully. Um, that's really interesting. I like that idea. There's a lot of interesting stuff that you can do there, but uh, I just, I don't know, I thought it was really a clever way for Ultraman to defeat these two kaiju, the mecha and the natural kaiju, and uh, yeah, I, it's pretty cool, pretty neat. Uh, good stuff. Um, I like the fact that the kaiju have a logic, have a region, a reason to do certain things, and uh, I think it's a lot you can do if you play with that. Um, I think it can get out of hand, get a little silly, but I'll, I might talk about that later in this issue. Or maybe I'll wait till uh, the next series to talk about it. Uh, splashy spread. So it's like the second or third page in. There's this great splashy spread with uh, Ultraman fighting both kaiju at the same time. He's in the ocean. It's a great double page spread. And uh, like one of them has a tail wrapped around his forearm or something like that. And he's you know trying to fight him. Looks super cool. Looks great. I love it. It's fantastic. Uh, I like at the end, um, I don't think they've really had an opportunity to do it in this series yet, but he, at one point, uh, well, after the battle's over and the bomb, the, you know, like, energy core or whatever of the Mecha Kaiju has been, uh, you know, taken out and extracted and thrown up into the sky where it can explode harmlessly, basically, uh, he flies off like Ultraman does after battles, and, uh, I could practically hear the uh, which is pretty cool, and, uh, I thought that was pretty fun, um, there's a scene where Ultra and uh, Shin are talking, and it's after he's talked to his dad, and it's like this sunset scene, and he's walking along. Beautiful, beautiful colors uh, in the background. It's like, you know, the pink, orange, 
you know, gold, yellow, whatever, uh, sunset sky, which is, you know, cliche or whatever, but it's, you know, just like Romeo and Juliet. It's cliche because it's beautiful and, and wonderful, and uh, no matter people want to imitate it or, or you know, keep calling back to it because it's just, it's that good. Um, so I like that a lot. Um, yeah, I like that a lot. And uh, it was just, it was really great work. And the colors in general were nice, but just like that really drew my, drew my attention. I realized, wow, this, this looks really good. I think there's a lot of shadow play in there too, because it's like sunset and um, you know, the sun's over there, so the shadow's coming as you know, he's walking across along his path and they're talking or whatever. So that was pretty, pretty cool. Uh, let's see, last thing. Oh, I love the tease at the end. So, you know, spoilers, spoilers, spoilers. This comic's been out for, I think, over a month or close to a month now. Um, there's going to be an Ultra 7 spinoff, and I like how Dan Morboshi um, got back some of his, ul his Ultra power um, by draining some away from, uh, from Shin. That was pretty cool. I like that. And... Um, I'm going to bring back some speculation from the last review. Uh, I wonder if they're going to have to implement Kato to help counteract the activity of a rogue Ultra man in Ultra 7, if that in fact is what's going to happen. So, uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. Pretty cool. Um, also, it's really cool because in the beginning, in the Rise of Ultraman, we saw a preview, I think in the beginning one, Shin and the Ultra touched, um, there was a vision, I believe, of the future of Ultraman and Ultra 7 fighting each other, which didn't make any sense, except for now it looks like they've been planning that all along, which is pretty cool. I, I like that. Um, so my big thought on this episode is uh, skepticism is a virtue. And the reason I'm saying that, and actually, how's that? You know, oh, yeah, scared of Ultraman. It ties back to my title that the, I pulled the quote from Shin's dad. Shin's dad is scared of Ultraman. And a lot of these um, conspiracy theorist type people are scared of Ultraman. But I think it's only natural. Um, I'm personally scared of the fact that there are a bunch of Trident-class submarines uh, circling the planet under the ocean that have enough nuclear arms on them to destroy all life on this planet, or at least you know all human life, which is the life I care most about uh, on this planet. If the if Americans ever do something stupid, or if the Russians ever do something stupid, or whatever, these nuclear weapons could go off and just obliterate all life that I care about, and uh, that's not a comforting thought. Um, I'm not happy with the military-industrial complex, which has perpetuated this thing. There's a nuclear arms lobby in Washington, D.C., where it's people who work for nuclear arms companies get to say, hey, let's make more nuclear warheads, like we don't have enough already to destroy all the world. So Shin's dad being scared of Ultraman being his son, especially with the backstory thing that we learned, which is a shocking to us that I won't really touch on, but he thinks he's too irresponsible as a 20-year-old, which I can't believe he's only 20, but he's a, an, he thinks he's too irresponsible as a 20-year-old to wield all that power. And it's interesting because Shin's dad's skepticism isn't skepticism that the government should have that power. It's that his son should have that power for the reasons, uh, you know, that are between them personally. And um, I also, that was a really neat nod or, or, or concept that uh, the Ultra did not see that in Shin's memory when they were having their integration or whatever with each other, uh, which is kind of interesting. Anyway, um, so yeah, Shin's dad is doubtful that his son is worthy of having that power. Does he think the government should have that power? Does he think the USP should have that power? Uh, you know, not his son. Uh, of course, it's interesting that we get a seemingly evil Ultra in Ultra 7. Um, at the end of this episode, we get that big twist and, and, and you know, turn. And I think he gets to giant size. So, like, yeah, you've got an evil, you know, gigantic, you know, super powerful weapon guy uh, in Dan Morboshi. And, like, I don't think... Um, you know, Shin's dad can blame Shin for getting duped and getting manipulated and having his, you know, ultra power taken and, and you know, guess getting, uh, like, jump-starting Dan Morboshi's ability to, you know, turn into an Ultraman. Um, so, uh, like, he's not, you know, personally responsible for that. He's not culpable for it, but there are other groups who are culpable and, like, the conspiracy theorist people are right to an extent to be suspicious of the, um, of the USP and, uh, you know, the potential power grab that will be committed by the USP or the International, you know, um, Council on Kaiju or whatever uh, that exists in this world. Uh, because, you know, what does that mean? Uh, there are Kaiju here and they flourish on human suffering. So we're going to put everybody on happy drugs all the time to force them to be happy so that it won't empower the Kaiju anymore. Like, is that what they would do? Um, like, what what is going to be the response of the government to do this? Um, like, they don't really explain well what they're doing, but, um, when Shin and Kiki are unsure about, you know, why they just saved their enemies, uh, which I, my answer to that is because that's what heroes do. Um, the, uh, the commander guy, Matsuruka, Mataru Kaja, that's a persona and Shin Wakami Tensei reference there. If you get that, you get that. If you don't, it's okay. 
Uh, but yeah, Mataru Kaja, he, uh, <laughs> Captain Muramatsu, I think is who it is. Anyway, um, he's like, hey man, we just changed the world overnight, telling people that they're kaiju, telling them that everything that they've ever known is wrong, and, uh, you know, some people are gonna hate us, some people are gonna, uh, come around to us eventually, and some people, you know, accept us readily, so we just kind of have to deal with it at time, give them time, be patient, and help these people, you know, you know, bring them in. I think he actually says this, which I was saying this too, like, you don't, push them away and isolate them and, and marginalize them, you kind of, you try to bring them in and say, hey, let us explain to you, let us help you understand what's going on. I know it's crazy, but this is why we're doing these things, et cetera, et cetera. And I thought that was really good. I thought that was really strong. Um, so I go back against what I was saying before. Uh, I don't believe that Higgins and Groom are uh, lacking in seeing the nuance here. I think they were setting it up and letting it play out, um, which... I can deal with. Um, I mean, that's good. That's good storytelling. Uh, I'll be, I'd be curious to know, um, if some less, <laughs> this is going to sound super arrogant. If people who care less about freedom than I do, who are into this stuff, uh, what they say about the comic, because I think it's making a good argument for like not locking down, not attacking people who have different opinions than you and, uh, like letting things play out for the ultimate good. Um, so anyway, that, that's how I read it. That's how, what I walk away from because that's, you know, kind of where my values lie. Uh, the art, four to five again. Story, four to five. Last issue, I gave it a two uh, because of I was unsure about where it was going, but they stuck the landing here and it was good. This book is a recommend. Um, I need to change my comments there. This book is a recommend and this whole series is a recommend so far. Both The Rise of Ultraman and The Trials of Ultraman and I'm very much looking forward to The Mystery of Ultra 7 or whatever they called it, which I think that's what it's called. Anyway, I don't remember now but that's okay. Uh, I'm going to go, <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and get out of here. So, uh, yeah, if you, uh, liked my review and you want to push back against, or if you've liked or disliked this and want to push back against what I'm saying about like the conspiracy theorists and being skeptical of who has power, um, like skepticism is a virtue in general, just as long as you're not a jerk about it, but you should always kind of trust, but verify, right? Um, that's a good thing to go with. You don't just want to blindly trust people because when you do, you get fooled and duped and manipulated, right? So we want to have a measure of skepticism. Uh, but like, if you want to discuss that more, I'd love to hear your comments on that. Um, and if not, that's okay too. But I, I would like some interaction to be fun, but I'm enjoying just uh, reading and talking about this stuff. So thank you for your time and attention. I hope you enjoyed this. Check out my growing collections of analysis, art, and fiction. The bottom of the show notes might just feature a design relevant to the topic at hand. Click around and find out. You can also visit mjmunoz.com slash support to see my latest designs and more. I welcome all forms of critique to improve my craft, so don't hold back any comments you have for me. Mm -hmm. I leave you with peace and blessings. This is MJ signing out.